uh, sorry for the uh, for the technical difficulties, but uh, so we just had a, a just switch switch of order. Uh, so we next have Enrico Barraza from uh, CISA, who's gonna continue the theme of modifying uncensored relativity and black holes uh, by telling us about black holes and Lorentz violating theories of gravity. Take it away, Enrico. Well, thank you, Nayesh, and thanks to the organizers for, uh, for the invitation. So I was asked to talk about black holes uh, in Lorentz violating gravity. So I'll do my best, even though I haven't, uh, well, I've worked on Lorentz violating gravity lately, but most of the work I'll be talking about about black holes is, uh, is review of my results and uh, other people's results. So without further ado, this is the plan of the talk. So I'll start by motivating uh, Lorentz violations in gravity, how we go beyond, uh, how, how we violate Lorentz symmetry and why. And then I'll talk about experimental constraints on Lorentz violations, mainly in, in the gravitational sector. So this will serve me as a uh, as prerequisite for uh, talking about black holes and Lorentz violations. In particular, we'll discuss the very concept of a black hole in the absence of Lorentz symmetry, because the concept of a black hole is deeply connected to, the, uh, to that of uh, to, to, to Lorentz symmetry and finite propagation speed. So we show how uh, Naively, you wouldn't expect black holes to even make sense if you violate Lorentz symmetry, but I will show you how, uh, in the end, um, we can recover the concept of a, of a black hole horizon, even in the absence of Lorentz symmetry. And I will close with uh, a list of open problems and uh, discussion points, which we can hopefully address uh, later on. So Lorentz violations in gravity. I hope you can see my, my cursor, by the way, and you don't see this banner. Uh, Lorentz violations in gravity, why and how? So uh, Lorentz symmetry is, of course, in the form of diffeomorphism invariance. Is of sorry, course I don't think we do see your cursor. Um, you see cursor? Oh, no, I, no, we do. Sorry, okay. we do see your cursor. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, so Lorentz symmetry in the form of diffeomorphism invariance uh, is, of course, one of the building blocks of general relativity. And uh, it's very tightly constrained in matter. But the bounds that you get up until very recently in the gravitational sector are, are much looser. So it makes sense to, from, uh, from a certain point of view to try to violate Lorentz symmetry in the gravitational sector just because we can, to see if we can put tight constraints on Lorentz violations in gravity. And in order to, of course, to put constraints, we need to understand what the observational consequences of these violations may be. So in the course of this talk, I will not break Lorentz symmetry too poor, but I will rather break um, uh, just boosts. So we not break spatial rotations, although that's a very uh, concrete possibility. In fact, it's being used to construct theories of uh, Lorentz violating massive gravity, but I will focus on violations of boost symmetry. So I will introduce a preferred, uh, a preferred time in a sense reminiscent of Newton's absolute time. Uh, and you can do that in two different ways. So you can either introduce a preferred threading of space-time, and this is what goes under the name of einstein heater theory. So you can choose at each space-time event a preferred time direction, or you can choose a preferred foliation of your space-time, a dynamical slicing of your space-time, um, which serves as, uh, as, uh, as, as a dynamical absolute um, time coordinate. And this is what... Um, is known uh, under the name of chronometric theory or Kojava gravity. Uh, one interesting thing is that when you introduce uh, violations of boost symmetry, you have necessarily, of course, an, an anisotropic uh, uh, scaling of space and time. So your dispersion relation for, for, uh, for, for the graviton in this case, because we're violating Lorentz symmetry in gravity, is no more linear. So you don't have uh, omega proportion to k, but you have something more general. Omega squared equals k squared plus higher order correction. So you have uh, these higher powers in the, in the wave numbers, but not in the frequency. And this shows you already why the concept of a black hole uh, will be complicated in these theories because if you consider the group of velocity corresponding to this dispersion relation, you will see that this group of velocity uh, diverges in the UV. So, and you might wonder what a black hole horizon even means if you have uh, signals that propagate at infinite speeds, albeit only in the um, in the UV limit. Nevertheless, as I will as I will say, I think in the next slide. Um, this uh, anisotropic scaling of space and time uh, leads to a much better UV behavior uh, for, uh, for gravity. And this is, in fact, it's been shown to lead at least, at the very least, to uh, power counting renormalizable uh, gravitational interactions. 
So entering a little bit more into the details, if I want to break um, boost symmetry in four dimensions uh, by introducing a preferred uh, um, space-time uh, um, uh, threading, so a preferred time direction at each point of your space-time, I can introduce a, a, a unique norm uh, vector field, which goes by the name usually of the ether, which is um, supposed to be time-like and it's forced to be time-like by means of a Lagrange multiplier. And they can add all possible terms which are quadratic in derivatives of the ether. So what I've done here, uh, which dates back uh, in fact to Jacobson and, uh, and Mattingly uh, 20 years ago by now, is to introduce um, a kinetic term, which is comprised of a square of the expansion of the ether vector, the square of the, the shear, the square of the vorticity and the square of uh, uh, the acceleration. And this is what is known as uh, Einstein ether uh, theory. There is another version of this theory, which I mentioned already, called Java gravity, whereby you don't have a preferred threading of your space time, but a preferred foliation, in which case you impose that this vector field is um, a hypersurface orthogonal. So you have no um, vorticity um, term here because the vorticity is zero for a, for a hypersurface orthogonal vector field. And um, you impose that uh, the vector field is the gradient of a scalar. And this scalar is what we call sometimes the chronon, is the scalar whose set, whose level sets are um, constitute uh, the space like surfaces that constitute the preferred foliation of your space time. So, this color field T, which is Lorentz violating because it's time like, defines a preferred foliation of your space time. Uh, some of you might have been uh, exposed or might have seen um, the second version of the theory of Java gravity in a different, in a slightly different form. In fact, you can uh, exploit the fact that this chronon defines a preferred slicing of your space time, and you can uh, use the chronon itself as time coordinate. Uh, so if you set that for the time coordinate equals to, to this chronon field, you get a three plus one, um, three plus one action which looks uh, eerily similar to, to GR in the sense that you have here the extrinsic curvature square, you have the trace of extrinsic curvature, but you see the coefficient and you here you have the three dimensional uh, Ricci curvature. But as, uh, as you can see the, the coefficients in front of these two terms or in front of these three terms are different, are not the same, uh, unlike they are in GR. And if you uh, go and check if uh, uh, the theory is diffeomorphism invariant, and uh, you will see that it is not. Um, there is also this extra term, which is the square of the acceleration of your foliation. So A is essentially the, the log derivative of the lapse. Uh, so it turns out that this theory, which is completely equivalent to the one we wrote before, which was written in terms of uh, um, a vector field, of a Stuckelberg field, uh, only satisfies um, invariance under three-dimensional diffeomorphisms and time reparameterization. So it breaks uh, Lorentz symmetry. So the original proposal by Hojava was actually to, to consider this as the infrared action um, and complemented with uh, UV terms involving four and six spatial derivatives. So these terms, which I uh, collectively denoted as L4 and L6 here, um, are uh, at the, the origin of that nonlinear dispersion relation that I, that I showed before. And, um, uh, and yeah, so this theory is uh, something which is, um, which is important to mention is that this theory um, doesn't have, even in the infrared, um, already at the infrared, doesn't have any ghosts. In particular, uh, it, uh, because it doesn't have any terms that depend on the derivative of the labs. So if you look at uh, um, uh, what you do when you, when you go to this um, preferred foliation, you identify the, the vector field, which in turn is the gradient of the chronon field with the labs. So if this action included n dot terms, so time derivatives of the labs, it would include second time derivatives of the chronon field, and therefore it would have third order equations in time for the scalar field. So you would have an Ostrograsky ghost. So uh, a, a key point in the original construction by, by Hojava, and uh, which was generalized or studied also by other, um, other people, such as uh, Diego Blas, Sergei Sibirkov, and others, uh, 
is that there must be no end dot terms in the action. Otherwise, you would have an Ostrogaski ghost. And this poses, as I will show, in, as I will say in the next slide, uh, problems when it comes to the uh, renormalizability or to proving the re renormalizability of the theory. Yeah, so to, to, to expand on this point, Java gravity was proposed as a, a theory, a, com a UV complete theory of, uh, of quantum gravity. Uh, the motivation being that if you if you have just a scalar field with an isotropic scaling between space and time, so what is called a Lipschitz um, uh, a Lipschitz field, uh, the theory is power counting renormalizable. It's quite easy to show, at least at the power counting uh, level. Uh, so the, the hope is that this uh, theory that we have, which shows the same behavior but in gravity, would uh, present the same um, uh, the same features. Uh, and uh, however, this is much more difficult to prove if you have gravity than if you have a scalar field, because of gravity, of course, has an. Uh, I mean, the, the, you have to deal with the different with with the choice of gauge, essentially. So it's very tricky to show that full fledged. Ojava gravity is renormalizable beyond power counting. So it's been proved uh, to, to the best of my knowledge only in, in a specific case in which the lapse is forced to be a function of time alone. This is known as the projectable version of Ojava gravity, but it's very difficult to prove it in general, exactly because you don't have this kinetic term for the lapse in the action. And uh, this is, if you want, a technical problem, but it's one that uh, has prevented uh, proving renormalizability of the theory uh, beyond power counting and beyond the projectable case. So this is definitely um, an open problem. The other open problem, um, and which is quite uh, an obvious one, is uh, the fact that, of course, Lorentz symmetry is a very good approximation of uh, what we see in nature in the matter sector. So it's very difficult to, to reconcile uh, the small level of Lorentz violations that we see in matter with, the, with Lorentz violations already in the infrared uh, in the gravitational sector. So once we introduce Lorentz violations in gravity, we need to worry about what we call the percolation of Lorentz violations from gravity uh, to matter. And uh, in other words, we have to worry about how do we recover uh, Lorentz symmetry at low energies, because this is what we observe in nature. So there are several ideas uh, about this. Uh, some uh, involve uh, um, essentially supersymmetry, so um, uh, supersymmetry and, uh, and um, uh, could, uh, could actually suppress uh, renormalizable, um, uh, that, that means um, uh, renormalizable uh, Lorentz violating operators. And uh, therefore, could, uh, uh, even if supersymmetry is broken at high energy, it could keep this uh, renorm the renormalizable operators uh, could keep the coefficients in front of them to be to be very small. Uh, other um, ideas uh, involve um, the, are essentially the idea that Lorentz symmetry could be recovered in the infrared as a result of renormalization group flows. But all these uh, ideas are sort of fuzzy in the sense that they they, they haven't been worked out um, in detail. So my point of view is that on the one hand. Uh, Lorentz variations in gravity seem to uh, produce a desirable uh, behavior in the UV, perhaps producing a theory which is power counting renormalizable or even beyond power counting. On the other hand, they open a whole new range of problems because you have to worry about how you recover uh, Lorentz symmetry in matter at low energies. So, um, so yeah. So before I go into black holes and to into the um, uh, and to the experimental constraints on Lorentz symmetry and gravity, I want to say a few words about um, this point. So the fact that in order to prove renormalizability beyond power counting, uh, the absence of a kinetic term in the lapse is, um, is a roadblock. So just to, to say it again, the, the fact that there are no kinetic terms uh, in the lapse implies that the lapse satisfies um, has a propagator which is of this sort, one over k squared, where k is just a spatial part of the wave number. And so, in other words, the lapse satisfies an elliptic equation, 
uh, with instant, instantaneous propagation. And this is the, the main um, technical drawback that prevents, uh, one of the technical drawbacks that prevents proving renormalizability in full-fledged um, Hojava gravity. So in a recent paper, we tried, although to some extent unsuccessfully, to, to generalize chronometric theory or Hojava gravity to allow for this kinetic term in the labs. So even though this uh, uh, is only partially successful, I wanted to, um, to explain it in a couple of slides and perhaps discuss it uh, later. So what we, yeah, so what we did was to take Hoshava gravity and write it again in terms of, uh, um, in, in terms of Stuckelberg fields. So we introduce uh, the chronon scalar field, which for which I convenience I changed the name because uh, so I called it phi. So phi is this Lorentz violating scalar field. And we wrote the action of uh, Hojava gravity in terms of uh, four dimensional Ricci curvature plus these terms, this ugly term, ugly looking terms uh, that involve derivatives of the scalar field. Uh, so from this uh, action, uh, which is second order in derivatives of uh, the scalar field, you would expect, or you would, um, you would guess that the equations of motion would be third order in the field, because you have two derivatives of the scalar field here. If you take the variation, you would expect the equations of motion to involve phi triple dot, which would amount to an Ostrograsky ghost. This does not happen in Hojava gravity. And uh, exactly, and it's not apparent at all from this action, uh, there is a cancellation when you go to the uh, to the preferred foliation. When you go to the uh, to the three plus one action, it turns out that the, there is a tuning between the coefficients of these terms that cancels the uh, n dot term in the unitary action. So this is how I for for a long time I thought. Um, I mean, I, I, this is indeed the reason why Hojava gravity or chronometric theory doesn't have uh, Ostrograsky ghosts. But there is also another um, way in which you can avoid ghosts and still have a, a second, an action which involves uh, second derivatives of scalar field. And the idea is provided by what is called the generate higher order scalar tensor theories. So the ghost action, as it is also known, avoids the presence of an Ostrograsky ghost by um, by by uh, by tuning the coefficients so that uh, the Hessian of the kinetic term is the generate. So th this is the so so uh, Hojava gravity is one particular way of imposing that the kinetic term for the scalar field is the generate. So I will say a little bit more about that in the next slide. Let me say that this tuning of the coefficients. Uh, in Hojava gravity, which eliminates n dot in the unitary action in the three plus one action, is actually uh, not just the tuning, uh, classical tuning, but it's also um, stable under radiative corrections because it's protected by one symmetry uh, of the Hojava action, reparameterization symmetry. So this tuning of the coefficients is stable under a, a, a reparameterization of the scalar field. So there is a symmetry that protects this tuning. In, in, in this sense, Hojava gravity doesn't have any ghost even in the UB. So what we tried to do in a, in, in a recent paper was to instead to find another way to, uh, to make the Lagrangian um, of Hojava gravity avoid the Ostrograsky ghost. So we tried to include uh, derivatives, time derivatives of the laps. So here I introduced D to be the, essentially the lead derivative of uh, the laps. So I and we try to write down the most generic kinetic term of the laps. And then what we did, we follow the same procedure, which is um, uh, which one follows in the generate higher order scalar tensor theories. And we try to impose that the kinetic term of um, the, 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 kinetic, the kinetic term of this Lagrangian be the generate. So this imposes a primary constraint um, on, on the theory, which eliminates half a degree of freedom. And in turn, this primary constraints generate a secondary constraint, which uh, kills another half degree of freedom. So this is a way to avoid the presence of an Ostrograsky ghost. 
And uh, so if you crunch the numbers and compute what is the, the determinant of this, uh, um, of the kinetic matrix and impose the determinant um, to be zero, you'll find that this imposes a tuning or a relation between the coefficients. Um, in particular, it determines essentially the coefficient of the kinetic term of the laps. So this is the degeneracy condition that allows this action to avoid the presence of uh, Ostrograski uh, ghosts. Again, this is the same construction as the one that one um, follows to construct the degenerate higher order scalar tensor theories and to avoid the presence of ghosts. So we've written, if you want the generalization of a uh, chronometric theory or Kojava gravity at low energies, which involves uh, a time derivative for the laps uh, by um, imposing a suitable degeneracy condition on the coefficients of the action. And the problem that we're facing, uh, and Hojava gravity in particular, is another way of imposing this degeneracy condition. So Hojava gravity corresponds to omega equals zero and sigma equals zero. So this omega and this sigma are just two coefficients. They have nothing to do with the um, vorticity and shear that I showed before. So they're just two coefficients. And Hojava gravity doesn't have these two terms. So Hojava gravity has omega equals sigma equals zero, which satisfies this degeneracy condition. So, and this could open the, I mean, we hope that this could open the way to, to proving uh, renormalizability of the full theory in the, in the UV. Uh, the problem is that we couldn't, we have yet to identify a symmetry that protects this tuning of the coefficients. So the tuning of the coefficients in Hojava gravity was protected by reparameterization invariance. Whereas here, this tuning doesn't seem to be protected uh, by a symmetry we could identify. So uh, in general, uh, the, a, a detuning of this condition will be produced by radiative corrections. So from this point of view, this is a failed attempt, but uh, at the very least, it shows that uh, Java gravity or chronometric theory in the infrared is in a sense a generic, the, the most generic theory you can write, at least uh, at, uh, at low energies, with avoiding, of course, um, the presence of ghosts. Um, I think I'm going um, a bit, yeah, I'm not sure how much time I, I have. have. Uh, seven, uh, sorry, yeah, seven minutes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, I thought I had 13. I had uh, more. I, I'll try to, to make. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I, I, with, with the time for questions, uh, yeah. Well, okay. something, yeah. yeah so okay. I'm going to have another five minutes for questions. Uh, but yeah, yeah. I, mean, no, no, I, I think I know how much time uh, it has lapsed. I just can't see how many slides I have left. <laughs> I, I wanted to see them on the side, but I couldn't. I guess we'll out. find out. We'll find out. We'll find out. OK. <laughs> well, th this is so much for the introduction on, uh, on Hojava gravity. So I want to, before I go and talk about the black holes, I want to spend a couple of words about experimental balance on this theory, uh, because I think it's important to discuss the question of uh, uh, black holes and uh, how likely it is that we'll ever observe a deviation um, uh, from, from GR at the level of black holes um, as a consequence of Lorentz violations. So when it comes to the spectrum of these theories, einstein ether theory, because it has it violates Lorentz symmetry by introducing a vector field, has uh, has additional gravitons with respect to GR. So it has a spin two or a tensor mode, but it also has scalar and vector modes. So spin zero and spin one uh, modes. Uh, whereas the chronometric theory or Kojava gravity version of the theory only has a scalar mode. In fact, the chronon on top of course of the usual tensor modes of GR. So there are a number of um, uh, observ uh, observational and theoretical constraints that you can place on the theory. So you need the propagation speeds of these modes to be real, of course, because you want no tachyonic instabilities. You want uh, energy, the energy of um, uh, perturbations to be uh, to be positive. That's certainly a requirement that you can place and which um, constrains the low energy theory. Uh, quite surprisingly, when I give this talk, people uh, are sometimes surprised. We want the propagation speeds of these extra gravitational modes to be super luminal if we want to pass existing constraints from ultra high energy cosmic rays. The idea is being that if you have a um, gravitational modes which are subluminal, uh, ultra high energy cosmic rays could decay in these modes 
by a Cherenkov cascade. So you want to avoid that because we do see ultra high energy cosmic rays in the universe. So you want these modes to be superluminal. And I want to stress there is no violations of causality as a result of this. Um, and if you if you want to discuss more about that, I can give you more details. But there is absolutely no deviation, no violation of causality as a result of superluminal propagation. Um, there are constraints from GW 170817. Uh, which forces the velocity of gravitational waves to be the same as that of light to within a part in 10 to the 15. That places extremely strong constraints on these theories to the point of almost ruling them out in some directions of parameter space. There are constraints from solar system and even constraints from cosmology, in particular Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Um, I think, uh, yeah. Um, okay, so. Uh, I want to, since I'm, I'm, I was supposed to talk about black holes, I thought I would add also a couple of slides, not on black holes per se, but in general on compact objects. So there are also constraints coming from uh, um, binary pulsars on these theories. And I wanted to say a couple words. I have, I think, just two slides, which I was editing uh, before this talk. So they, they're probably not very polished, but um, yeah, so. In general, when you have Lorentz violations in gravity, we expect also to violate what we call the strong equivalence principle. So the universality of free fall in systems of strongly gravitating compact objects, black holes and neutron stars. So let me say a few more words about that. So first of all, how do we couple matter to, to a theory like Ojava gravity? Certainly we don't want to couple matter directly to the Lorentz violating field. So we have a chronon field or an ether field which violates Lorentz symmetry. We certainly don't want any couplings at three level between matter fields and the chronon or the ether. Otherwise, we would be killed by particle physics experiments or other experiments. So we want to impose what is called sometimes the weak equivalence principle. So the universality of free fall for, for test particles, for bodies of negligible self-gravity. Self and we want to couple, therefore, matter to the metric alone, not to the to the, um, the chronon field or to the vector field. So as a result, matter or weakly gravitating matter at the very least will follow geodesics of the metric. So this uh, will be so. So you re re recover the universality of free fall at three level. On the other hand, as I showed uh, perhaps um, very briefly before, but when, when you have, a, the, if you look at the chronon and ether action, the chronon and ether fields, they couple non minimally to the metric. So because matter is coupled to the metric and the metric is coupled non minimally to the, the chronon or ether field, when you go beyond three level and you start doing perturbation theory, you get in strong gravity regimes an effective coupling between the matter and the chronon fields mediated by the metric perturbation, mediated by the tensor gravitons. So if you think in terms of Feynman diagrams, you have, a, um, yeah, so you, you have an interaction mediated uh, with, with the, uh, the ether or the chronon in the vertex, uh, sorry, with, with the, the, the tensor gravitons in the vertex and the propagator due to the, uh, to the chronon. And uh, so this is what is called uh, Norvet effect. So it's been known for since the 60s in brand theory because there is a similar effect in brand theory. So it's a violation or, or in, in no minimal coupling between matter and um, uh, the Lorentz violating field mediated by the tensor modes. And this, is, this becomes important when the metric perturbations are large and therefore when the uh, bodies are strongly gravitating. Uh, for those of you who come, uh, maybe are familiar with brand theory, this is known in brand theory as, as an effect uh, parameterized by what is called sensitivities or charges. And it's very important in brand theory and the same in, in Lorentz relative gravity because it produces deviations of gravitational emission away from, uh, um, uh, away from the quadruple formula of GR. So as a result of this Norbert effect of these effective charges coupling matter and the Lorentz radiating fields, you have dipolar gravitational wave emission in systems of, of, of potential, at least, in systems of binary pulsars or binary neutron stars. And this is an important effect because dipole emission uh, appears at negative PN order 
and therefore it dominates the low frequency in spiral of gravitational wave emitting binaries. And uh, um, maybe I'll, I'll speed up a little bit and skip a few slides. Of course, there is no uh, evidence of dipolar gravitational emission in binary pulsars, which are in complete agreement with uh, the quadruple formula of, uh, of GR. And so this has been used historically by myself and collaborators to, to put um, very strong constraints on, uh, on these theories. So let me skip this slide because it's, it's too complicated and I'm running short of time because I want to get finally to the black holes. Uh, let me just say that if you then, if you consider all possible uh, experimental bounds on Lorentz violations in gravity at low energies, so I'm talking about the infrared limit of the theory. Uh, so uh, summarizing, this is uh, theoretical constraints, absence uh, of ghosts, absence of gradient instabilities, positive energies, uh, solar system tests, cosmological constraints, binary pulsars, and uh, uh, ultra high energy cosmic rays, you essentially almost rule out Lorentz violations at, uh, at low energies, uh, provided those are described by chronometric theory, that is infrared Kojava gravity or Einstein ether theory. Uh, let me elaborate on that. What do I mean? So in, I showed in the beginning that Einstein ether theory can be parameterized by four coupling dimensions as coupling constants. So there is a four dimensional parameter space. If you factor in all these constraints, including, sorry, I forgot the GW1708 17 bound on the speed of gravitation waves, you essentially have a two dimensional parameter space out of this four dimensional parameter space. So only two of the coefficients which you, uh, you start with are significantly non-zero. And the particular one, uh, what the coefficient in front of the acceleration is as small as 10 to the minus five. So essentially only one of these two coefficients can be of order one. This is for Einstein's theory and for a chronometric theory, you have the same, the same problem. Um, you, you only have one of the coefficients, what is called small lambda, uh, which multiplies again the expansion of the chrono field uh, that can be different from zero. So the result out of these three or four directions in parameter space, only uh, a sub-manifold or sub-parameter space of measure zero uh, is, uh, remains viable. So this is from the experimental point of view. So uh, this doesn't mean, however, that Lorentz violations in gravity are, in, are uninteresting. So I wanted to, to say it out of, uh, of, of honesty because I was asked to give a review of this field. But I still think that it makes sense to, to think about Lorentz violations in gravity, even at low energies, in order to understand the concept of a black hole better. So if you think about how black holes are defined in, um, in GR, they are defined essentially in terms of the causal structure of the space time, in terms of the propagation of fields. So in the very special but simple case of uh, spherical symmetry, if you have a static spherical symmetric space time, the location of the event horizon corresponds to where your light cones tilt inwards. Uh, think about uh, what Schwarzschild looks like in edit non Finkelstein coordinates. So you define black holes in GR in terms of light cones. In, in a sense. And in GR, this is simple exactly because of Lorentz symmetry. You know that the limiting speed of matter and, and photons. Just to point that you're kind of running out of time, just like that. Okay, I'll be, I'll, be, I'll be done in two minutes. Uh, I'm 33 minutes according to my clock. <laughs> um, in GR, so we have a limiting speed, the speed of light. So in, uh, in Lorentz relative gravity, we have, uh, in fact, uh, more uh, fields. Uh, more gravitons, we have a tensor vector and scalar gravitons on top of matter. And they all have different propagation speeds because Lorentz symmetry is violated. So we have different propagation cones and therefore black holes in Lorentz relative gravity will have multiple horizons. Not only that, as I mentioned already in the beginning, if you want your Lorentz relations in gravity to provide a, a, a UV complete theory, uh, and possibly renormalize, and so a possibly renormalizable theory in the UV, you have to have a nonlinear dispersion relation, which produces infinite um, group speeds in the UV limit. And this raises the question of whether black holes exist at all in these theories, because if you have infinite propagation speed, you can escape 
from any existing horizon. So in the remaining two minutes, according to my clock, I will skip this slide and, um, and go to, to this one. So, uh, so it would seem that Lorentz violations um, in gravity and uh, horizons are an oxymoron. Uh, this is what I just said. Dispersion relations imply divergent group velocity in the UV. So you have instantaneous propagation, which would make would render the concept of the very concept of a black hole meaningless. Nevertheless, and th this was a uh, work that I did by now 10 years ago, time flies. Uh, it turns out that uh, because of the existence of a preferred foliation, you can still um, uh, have a well-defined meaning for black hole horizons. So this is, I promise, my last or um, one but last slide. So what happens is that if you study, if you solve the equations of the theory in spherical symmetry, static spherical symmetric uh, conditions, and um, you, you can of course find the solution, you can construct a Penrose diagram. And on top of this Penrose diagram for your solution, you can plot surfaces of constant chronon field. So again, this is the preferred foliation of your space time. It's a, an absolute time. And, and this is shown on the right here by these lines. So if you sit, Oops, I'm sorry. If you sit on this point and uh, propagate signals with uh, velocity equals to the speed of light, you're in this situation. Suppose now you can propagate signals with the increasing speed. So you would be able to escape from uh, uh, what was the, the GR uh, Swarship horizon. And in particular, if you have infinite propagation speed, you should be able to send signals from this point everywhere to the future of your preferred foliation. So the, the preferred absolute time grows in this direction. So you can send signals everywhere in the future of your, the slice on which you sit. However, uh, it turns out that in these uh, solutions, there, there is a foliation, a, a surface of constant chronon, which has the same topology as a, as a, as a sphere. So it encloses the central singularity. So there is a foliation like this in red. And if you're on this foliation, on this slice, even if you propagate signals with infinite speed, you can always move in the future. So you can never move backwards in time. So you, you're bound to hit the singularity and you can never reach infinity. And this is what we call the universal horizon. So again, it's a, a result of the existence of a preferred foliation of your space time. Uh, this is, I promise, yeah, this is my last uh, slide. I can skip the conclusions. There are several open problems of which uh, if this was an, a conference in person, I would be glad to, to discuss over coffee, but hopefully we can discuss in the discussion session. These universal horizons, they only seem to exist in the chronometric version of the theory. In the one in which you have a preferred foliation, but not in Einstein ether theory. So, so they exist in Hojava gravity, but not in Einstein ether theory. They seem to form in gravitation collapse. Uh, we've seen them form in gravitation collapse, but they seem to be uh, unstable to nonlinear perturbations when you go away from uh, spherical symmetry. Or when, the, for instance, when the black hole moves with respect to the chronon field. So stability of these horizons is an open problem. Uh, they also don't exist um, in einstein ether theory, which may seem uh, okay, because in einstein ether theory, you don't have a preferred foliation to start with, and it has no UV completion. But still, it's quite uh, interesting that these universal horizons do not exist in einstein ether theory unless you're in the spherical case. Uh, what is even more uh, interesting in the case of einstein ether theory is that uh, multiple horizons exist, but they are not killing horizons, which poses a problem for the thermodynamics of the theory. And in general, the thermodynamics of these black holes, of these universal horizons, or, or in the case of einstein ether theory of the non-killing horizon that, that uh, form in these black holes is an open question. And, and in general, uh, the, the effect of the UV terms, the, the, the L4 and L6 term, the, the terms of fourth and sixth order in derivatives uh, that are expected to be there in Kojava gravity and which are crucial for renormalizability, the effect of these terms on the central singularity of the black hole is an open problem. They are expected to resolve the central singularity of black holes, but they don't seem to do so in simple settings. 
and uh, I can elaborate on that. But uh, yeah, the, the fate of the central singularity in the presence of a, of a renormalizable theory is not um, is not clear at all. So I think I'll stop here because I'm badly out of time. You can read the conclusions if you want, and I'm happy to take questions now or um, in the discussion session. Apologies, Nayesh, for being late. Okay, no, no problem. Uh, this is a very interesting talk, but I don't think we can go with, we have too many questions. Maybe uh, I just see one question by Shinji. So let's just take that question. Go ahead, uh, Shinji. Yes, uh, thank you for the very nice talk. Uh, I have a question about uh, uh, this universal horizon. I mean, so the, do you think uh, this universal horizon can form dynamically? Yeah, we do see it form it dynamically in the. Yeah, so let me elaborate. Well, I'm asking there... this because uh, it seems that topology changes because before before the formation, the the I mean, so there is no hole, and uh, the after formation, there there should be a hole inside. The, I mean. The region inside this hole is not covered by constant time surface. So the topology of constant time surface changes before and after formation. So the, how, how it is possible to form a uh, universal horizon dynamically? That, that's my question. Well, I think the, Niyash also has a paper on this and I find the same, the same result. If I, if I consider the version of Rosario gravity on, which only has small lambda and, and which is related to, to the, the push button that Niyash knows mm -hmm. very well, uh, you uh, the theory becomes equivalent to to gr in the in the maximum slicing um, gauge and uh, uh, for, for the metric and uh, the, the the evolution of the foliation is described by the evolution of the preferred slicing uh, hypersurfaces in um, in gr so you can reinterpret the the formation the mm -hmm. simulations of uh, gravitational collapse in gr in the maximum slicing gauge in terms of uh, um, as, uh, as, as collapse in Kojava gravity. And what you see is that uh, surfaces, maximal surfaces with uh, trace of the extrinsic curvature equals zero, in fact, they pile up near uh, the universal horizon. So you never see, uh, strictly speaking, the formation of the universal oh, horizon. See. Because, so it takes because time. Yeah, uh, asymptotically in time, you should you should uh, you should form it. And in fact, uh, the, there are claims that the universal horizon is a Cauchy horizon for for the evolution. So you'll never be able to 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 see actually see the formation. But asymptotically, you should you should be able to. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. So so Thank thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, yes, indeed. And just just to add up, indeed, we have we have an exact solution with the collapsing dust shell where we show how this uh, these universal horizons form. And and since then, there have been numerical simulations. Also, that does show that uh, happening. So, um, uh, so thanks a lot, uh, Enrico. Uh, I think we, we're going to have much more, hopefully, in the discussions. But let's thank Enrico again.